uh, uh, construction of torsion Galois representations. And so um, there's two settings in which we want to do that. So I'll, I'm going to introduce sort of examples of those. So the first, the first one you might call the, the sort of Betty cohomology case. And uh, here the typical example is an arithmetic locally symmetric space like uh, the one associated to GLN over Q. Um, something like this for K uh, product over primes L of KL. Um, and I'll assume it's, it's neat just for simplicity, which will ensure that this uh, locally symmetric space is actually a, a, a real manifold. Um, and so what we're interested in here is the cohomology with, um, well, interested in the cohomology, uh, say with, of y with fp bar coefficients, so p will be a fixed prime throughout the talk, and the action of the uh, Heck algebra on this, where this is the Heck algebra associated to GLN, maybe with fp bar coefficients, so uh, well maybe I exclu exclude the prime p, um, but Okay, and of course there's the fantastic work of Peter Schulze in this setting, which I'll get to in a sec. Um, the other setting I want to consider is what you might call the coherent setting. Um, nope. So the... <laughs> Not gonna risk it. So the typical example of this is you have some Shimura variety and you want to consider the coherent cohomology of some uh, automorphic vector bundles on it. And so uh, maybe this requires a bit more notation to set up. So I want to consider something like um, what I'll call x, which will be the moduli space of principally polarized abelian varieties of dimension n, uh, and I want to consider this, say, over, over zp. Um, so in order to get integral structure on coherent cohomology, we'll have to work with integral models of a Shimura variety, uh, and, I sh and I should say, and prime to p level k, where now k is maybe product. KL, maybe uh, inside now GSP2N of the finite Adele's uh, open compact. And I'll assume that KP is GSP2N of ZP. Uh, yes. So, um, in order to study, so first of all, this Shimura variety is going to be non-compact, and in, in order to study uh, coherent cohomology, we need some compactifications, and the theory over something like ZP is due to fault ins and chai. So basically, we have our, Shimura, our Ziegel modular variety X, and we'll, ha we'll want to use the minimal compactification uh, as well as the toroidal compactification. Um, and I'll sort of recall more about these things as I need them, but uh, the basic thing to know is that the toroidal compactification is smooth and proper. And um, uh, the boundary uh, is a simple normal crossing divisor. Whereas the minimal compactification is 
going to be proper but not usually smooth. Um, OK, and so, so th there's our compactification, and we need also coefficients, so some coherent sheaves to take cohomology of. And so the way this works is that over, um, over say, the toroidal compactification, we have uh, sort of universal uh, semi-abelian scheme. And uh, using that, we can construct the canonical extension of the Hodge bundle, which I'll denote by E can, and that's just the pullback along the identity section of the sheaf of relative differentials. This is the identity section. And uh, from this, we produce. So from this, we produce all the other uh, coefficient systems we want just by applying the sort of usual uh, tensor functors. So, um, so now if rho is an algebraic representation of GLN on a finite free ZP module, uh, we may associate to uh, E can what I'll call V rho can um, and also V rho sub, which will just be V rho can um, with the condition of vanishing at the boundary. And so these, these are what go by the name of uh, automorphic vector bundles. Um, and um, one more thing, a bit of notation which I'll use. So, um, so I didn't give this map from the toroidal compactification to the minimal compactification name. I'm just going to call it pi for the whole talk, but I don't want to move the board to change it. So I'll consider um, omega to be the push forward of uh, the perfect vector bundle corresponding to the determinant representation, which is just another way of saying the push forward of the determinant of the Hodge bundle. And so basically by the construction of the minimal compactification, this is, is an ample line bundle. OK, and so uh, sorry? Yeah, so it's a, re it's a representation of the levy. I mean, th so th this is a n-dimensional vector bundle. So you want a representation of GLN to apply to it. Sorry. So OK, so what I mean then by coherent cohomology or torsion in coherent cohomology is to consider uh, um, say the, the cohomology on the troidal compactification of one of these automorphic vector bundles, maybe just the subcanonical one, although it doesn't really matter. Well, I guess it does matter, but. Um, mod p, um, and this will carry an action of the Heck algebra, but now for GSP 2n. Again, I don't want to consider Heck operators at p. Okay, so I guess then I, so today I'm going to discuss the proof of two theorems. So one of these theorems is very famous theorem of Peter Schultz, which I want to explain, is sort of different proof of. 
and that concerns the uh, Betty cohomology case. So the theorem says basically that if if you have a mod p eigenform in the FP, FP bar cohomology of this arithmetic locally symmetric space, then there's a Galois representation, uh, uh, semi-simple continuous Galois representation, rho f uh, from the Galois group of Q to GLN of FP bar, which is associated to rho, uh, to f. And what I mean by associated to f is just the usual thing that the um, characteristic polynomial of uh, Frobenii at unramified primes match up with the Heck eigenvalues. So maybe I'll call this theorem A. And then theorem B uh, concerns the coherent setting, which is going to say that if I have some, well, basically the exact same thing, if I have some f in the mod p cohomology of one of these, uh, oops, v rho sub, or I could put v rho con to it, doesn't really matter, because uh, they're related by star duality. I should extend to fp bar. Um, then there exists now a, a row f from the Galois group of Q to GL uh, 2n plus 1 of fp bar. And the reason it's a 2n plus 1 dimensional representation is that you should think that this is, so, I mean, the L group of GSP2G is G spin, oops, I switched, I don't want that to be G. Uh, GSP2n is G spin 2n plus 1, and then we have the standard representation. And so you should think that this is just the sort of standard Galois representation for a Ziegel modular form. OK, so now I need to be perfectly honest to put asterisks by both of these theorems, because as far as I'm aware, um, they're still conditional on uh, well, on Arthur's book. So maybe someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's still the case. And um, I should mention for this theorem B, there's, there's some related work. So there's, there's work of uh, Emerton, Reduzzi, and uh, Xiao, uh, and that's in the setting of sort of Hilbert modular forms mod P. Um, there's work of Poloni and Stroh, and I should say that what they do is kind of similar to what I'll explain today for the Ziegel modular variety. There's work of Poloni and Stroh, which, well, it proves a very similar result, but for a different uh, integral model of the Ziegel modular variety, the one that comes from uh, Peter Schultz's theory of the Hodge-Tate period map. Um, and it's sort of unclear what the relationship between the mod p cohomology of uh, that integral model and the mod p cohomology of the sort of usual one is. But, um, well. And so, th so their methods are very close to, to Schultz's. And then there's also work of Goldring and Garrity. And I believe they're doing something very similar to what I'm doing. So, so let me go ahead and explain uh, how, to, how to approach these terms. OK, so I, actually, I should say, if you're, if you're really concerned about this and want to prove unconditional theorems, I'm doing this sort of Q case for simplicity. But um, if instead you work with uh, 
a suitable uh, imaginary CM field uh, one can get away with sort of unconditional uh, base change results of Shin. And I guess the same is remarked in, in, in Peter's paper. So, but of course, we're also just waiting for these things to be available in complete generality. So, okay. So, the way I'm going to approach this, um, I'm going to deduce uh, theorem A from theorem B. So, and this strategy is sort of modeled off of the, the earlier work of uh, Harris, Land, Taylor, and Thorne, which, where they prove something like theorem A, except for characteristic zero cohomology classes. So, so let me explain the strategy. So, so I mean, the basic idea is the following sort of very simple construction. So, so I'm not going to use any sort of piatic Hodge theory to, to produce coherent cohomology classes. It's just a, a sort of direct construction as in the work of Harris, Land, Taylor, and Thorne. So what you're going to do is you're going to consider the following situation. So if you have D over FP bar, a simple normal crossing divisor, which just means that, well, it's, it's a union of irreducible components, which are smooth, maybe I should say proper. And whenever any number of components intersect, they intersect transversely, and components don't intersect themselves. So what you can, well, what you can do is, first of all, define for any subset of the indexing set S, um, you can define di to be the the intersection of the irreducible components um, it, in that set. And I'm going to assume, just for simplicity, because it will be true in the application, although it's not really necessary for this construction, uh, assume that di's are empty or irreducible. So. What you can do is you can construct a simplicial complex, uh, sigma, called the dual complex. And the way that this works is that the vertices, so it just keeps track of how the divisors intersect. So the vertices correspond to the elements of this set. And you have a simplex uh, connecting sort of a set i and s if and only if di is non empty. OK, so uh, what you're going to do is so because this is a normal crossing divisor, you have, you have a resolution of its structural sheaf, which we'll use to compute the coherent cohomology just of the structural sheaf. So the resolution goes like this you go to, well, the sum over all alphas of OD alpha to the sum over maybe all alpha, alpha not equal to beta of OD alpha intersect D beta, and so on. So it's a sum over sort of the ith term is uh, sets with i, maybe i plus one tuples, uh, sorry, i elements, and it's just the structural sheaf of di. And the maps are the sort of usual uh, alternating sums of restriction maps. So this is, a re this is actually a resolution of coherent sheaves because this is a simple normal crossing divisor. So what we're going to do is we're just going to use this to compute the cohomology of OD. So there's some spectral sequence um, which computes the cohomology of OD in terms of the cohomologies of all these intersections of irreducible divisors. And the way it looks
So this gives a spectral sequence, E1 PQ, you, uh, where you have the sort of sum over all sets of size P, uh, or maybe I want P plus 1, um, of HQ of DI ODI. And this computes HP plus Q of D. And so the idea is, if you look at the sort of P equals zero row of E1 page, what you see is just uh, so sum over all alphas of, say, FP bar goes to sum over all alpha betas with D alpha beta non-empty of well, FP bar, right? Because I mean, the section these these are all irreducible. The sections are just FP bar, and so on. And what you see is that this is exactly just um, so the simplicial cochain complex. with FP bar coefficients. And so when you, when you turn the page of your spectral sequence on the E2 page, you'll see the cohomology of this simplicial complex. And so what you get is an edge map from the cohomology of your simplicial complex into, um, the, co the coherent cohomology of this divisor. So that, I mean, this construction is probably well known, but I learned of it from essentially from the work of Harrison, Taylor, and Thorne. So how do we use it? So the idea... So if you don't assume that the intersections are irreducible? So there's some like, thing called a delta complex, and you get a delta complex. Yeah. The same, it, it still works. Uh, no, I want this board. I'm sorry. Okay, so we're going to apply this to the um, boundary of the toroidal compactification of our Ziegel modular variety. So. So what, exactly what I'm going to do is so we have the special fiber of our troidal compactification, and this has a boundary divisor, which I'm going to write as the union of two uh, normal crossing divisors, which I'll call D0 and D1. So D0 is the union of uh, divisors uh, contracted to a point by pi, the map down to the minimal compactification. And D1 is sort of the union of the rest. Okay, and so this will give us uh, some dual complexes, sigma zero, sigma one, which are subcomplexes of sigma. And um, I'm going to call U um, the complement of sigma one in sigma. So the sort of miracle of troidal compactification, which I can't really explain, but it essentially comes out of um, how you describe them near the boundary is that this U is simply a disjoint union of a number of copies of arithmetic locally symmetric spaces attached to uh, GLN. So I guess um, I learned of this fact from the work of Harris, Lyon, Taylor, and Thorne, and probably it appears earlier in the work of Harris and Zucker, and I don't know if that's it's probably the origin of it. So, um, and so that's the basis of, of the strategy. 
And so what do we do in, in fact? So I guess I should also say that um, at least if we choose our cone decompositions correctly, which haven't really made a point of, of the occlusion of sigma naught and u is a homotopy equivalence. In fact, u just deform it's easy to just directly deformation retract u under sigma naught. So, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to apply my uh, construction up there first to the whole di boundary divisor D. No, U, U is not a simplicial complex. It, it turns out to be an open. Uh, sigma 1 is a subcomplex. So if you, you can take the complement of a subcomplex inside a simplicial complex. And it turns out to be open, although maybe that's not automatic. So, so I'm going to apply the construction to sigma and to, to D and to D naught. Uh, sorry. And so there, there's a commutative diagram like this, where this is sort of the restriction map and this is the sort of natural map on cohomology. And so uh, this space sigma is a compactification of u. So by functoriality of cohomology with compact support, I have a map like this. And this space, well, th there's a map like this from the cohomology of u to the cohomology of sigma naught, which I said was an isomorphism. And then, of course, there's, there's this map, and this diagram commutes also. So, OK. Uh, and so basically, I mean, the cohomology classes we're interested in are somehow in here or in here. And so in general, when I make this construction, especially in characteristic P, there's no clear way to prove that like a map like this is injective. In fact, maybe it's just not. But there's one more trick we have, which is that this map is an isomorphism. And the reason is that, so when you consider this union of divisors D naught, all the irreducible components and all the intersections are actually just smooth proper torque varieties. And so uh, it turns out that this resolution, which is maybe non-existing anymore, for D naught is actually an acyclic resolution. And so this map is just an isomorphism. So all relevant DI are smooth, proper torque. OK, and so now if you stare at this diagram, so uh, if you have um, so So if we have a class in the image, so it, the, if I define the interior cohomology to be the image of compactly supported cohomology into ordinary cohomology, so if f is in the interior cohomology of u with fp bar coefficients, then, um, well, because, I mean, we can consider its image in here, and because this is an isomorphism all along, we see that um, its image in here is non-zero, so its image in here is non-zero. And so that means that system of Heck eigenvalues is going to sort of show up in here. So, okay, and then for things which are, sorry, for things which are not in the interior cohomology, there's a sort of standard devisage uh, to deal with them, which I won't discuss. So, so we've gotten there, and then now the point is just to consider uh, a, long, a short exact sequence of sheaves. Um, zero goes to the ideal sheaf of D, goes to uh, the structural sheaf of the special fiber of troidal compactification, goes to the structural sheaf of D. And so what you see is that if you have something which contributes to the cohomology of this, it'll either contribute to the cohomology of this or the cohomology of this. So uh, so, for example, if you if you contribute to this, you wind up in 
the cohomology of x tor fp bar of the ideal sheaf of D, or the cohomology of um, x fp bar tor of, so I guess, sorry, it's, there's a shift by one, so plus one, or the cohomology of the structural sheaf, and that by Sarah duality, that's the same as the dual of the cohomology of uh, the canonical bundle. And then uh, either of these two sheaves are of the form, did I erase the right board? No, I erased the wrong board. So either of those sheaves are of the form V rho sub, and so we're in the situation of theorem B, which I unfortunately just erased. Okay, so now I have to explain theorem B. Okay, so the first thing we want to do to approach theorem B is, uh, so first, pass to the minimal compactification. So in order to do that, we'll use a theorem which seems to have been independently discovered by Harris, Lan, Taylor, and Thorne, as well as by uh, Andreada, Iovita, and Piloni, and maybe proved in some great generality by Kaiwen Lan. And the theorem says that um, when you consider the push forward, I mean, when you consider push forwards from the toroidal compactification to the minimal compactification, the higher direct images of subcanonical automorphic vector bundles vanish. And so, oh, doesn't go up. So, so what that tells us is that the cohomology of, uh, say, X tor. Uh, v rho sub mod p, which is the thing we wanted to study, is the same as the cohomology of um, x min of just its push forward. OK, and so why do I want to work on the minimal compactification instead? Well, it's much nicer to produce congruences on the minimal compactification because um, we have an ample line bundle to use. OK. OK. <laughs> So for now on, I'm going to um, rename the push forward of this. So I'm going to call let V be um, the push forward of V rho sub. And I just want to warn you that this is almost never Uh, locally free, which is going to be, well, it is the source of some trouble, although I probably won't actually talk about the resulting trouble. So, okay, so now what I want to do is I want to compute the cohomology of V mod P. Um, and so, I mean, in, 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 in Schultz's argument and in the uh, paper of Polony and Stroh, the idea is that you have some very cool integral model of your Shimura variety such that special phi has a sort of heck equivariant, or heck of stable check cover, and you use that check cover to compute cohomology. But it's, it's not so hard to convince yourself that, for example, on AG for G bigger than 2, you can't expect um, such a check cover to exist on the usual integral model. And so the idea is, instead of trying to compute V using a sort of check cover, we'll try to use a sort of closed cover or something like that. So, so the thing to do is, We'll construct a resolution which goes like this. So we have uh, V mod P, which is the thing whose cohomology we want to compute. And it's going to go to uh, V tensor 
well, I'll have to explain the notation in a sec, but let me just write it. So the general term is going to be something of the form uh, v tensor some power of omega, and then restricted to um, some closed subscheme of the special fiber of the minimal compactification. And so I'm going to now list a sort of large number of properties that this resolution is going to have. So, well, first of all, I'll sort of describe it a bit. So these x's, we're going to have, uh, so x0 is just going to be the special fiber. And uh, x1, x2, et cetera, are just going to be some closed subschemes, which are unfortunately not going to be even close to being reduced. Um, and I'll describe what their reduction. So the reductions in practice will have a moduli interpretation, but for now it's sort of just a formal thing. So, okay, and now I should see what, what the maps in this uh, resolution look like. So maybe, let me get another board. I wrote way too big on this one. Uh. So, so the maps are going to be, so if I want to give the map from V tensor uh, omega to the mi minus 1 restricted to xi minus 1 to V tensor omega i, uh, uh, omega to the mi restricted to xi, well, it's just going to be the composition, first of all, you just take this thing and restrict it to xi. And then here you're going to, so this is going to be surjective, and there's going to then be a map which will turn out to be injective, uh, which is multiplication by some section, which I'll, well, I'll call ai, so ai is a section of um, uh, xi of omega to some power ni. And so mi is just mi minus 1 plus ni. And so eventually it'll turn out that the construction of these ais, which I call sort of generalized Hess invariants, will be sort of the whole point. But for now, let me just proceed with the sort of uh, formal part of the argument. Um, so the properties of this resolution that make it useful for constructing congruences are, um, so first of all, this is actually going to be an acyclic resolution. So uh, each of these sheaves, V tensor, uh, sorry, omega to the mi restricted to xi are acyclic. And moreover, um, if I consider the restriction map from, so, on, so now this is, I'll remind you, this is the, the whole sort of characteristic zero, or over ZP, minimal compactification. So we can consider the sections of V tensor omega to the MI. This is the free ZP module. And we can just restrict to this xi, which is a subscheme of the special fiber. So, well, x min v tensor omega to the mi restricted to uh, xi. And I'm going to ask that this restriction map be surjective. So, I mean, the point is that you're going to construct this resolution sort of step by step. And at each step, it's actually quite easy to arrange both of these properties. Um, so the point is that these are sort of automatic if, uh, 
mi is sort of sufficiently big, everything else being fixed just by sort of ser vanishing. And that's the point where we use omega as ample. So, okay, so if you believe all that, that there exists such a resolution, then it's easy to conclude the proof of theorem B because, well, um, oh, by the way, so the point, that, uh, what I meant to say is the reason that you can make this be as big as you want is that, well, suppose it's not true. Well, once you have this AI, you can just raise it to some huge power and then it will be true. So make the new AI just be a huge power of the old one. Okay. So, okay, so once you're there, then, so suppose you have some class in HI of V mod P, which is the thing we wanted to study. Then you can compute the cohomology by just taking uh, global sections everywhere of this complex, and because it's acyclic, and then taking cohomology. So you'll see that your system of Heck eigenvalues will show up in one of these things. And so then by the surjectivity of this map and the usual sort of delin ser lifting lemma, you'll see that there will be some uh, sort of Hecke eigenform in here whose Hecke eigenvalues lift that of the class you started with. And if you choose mi to be big enough, that uh, Hecke eigenform will be coming from some sort of cohomological automorphic representation, which you can attach a Galois representation if you know Arthur. So, Maybe I won't even write all that because, but, 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 so that's sort of the idea. So, um, okay, so everything basically comes, oh, oh, sorry, you should have said that, well, it wouldn't really make sense without this, but, um, so one more property that these AIs should satisfy is that the zero locus of AI is XI plus one. Probably if you're, <laughs> Thinking about why this complex is exact, you suspected that. I mean, the point being that, so I mean, the co-kernel of sort of the, the, the co-kernel of say the, the map here is going to be exactly this, and then we need to inject it into something else. So that's, that's how we make this a resolution. So yeah. So of course that's obviously extremely important. So I, so in the suitable sense, this whole complex ha has an action of. Of Hecke. Okay, so, okay, so, need to construct these AIs. And so the point is, well, first of all, what you'll do is you'll construct, and this is what I'll sort of explain in the last 15 minutes of my talk, uh, construct some, maybe what I'll call an AI prime, which will live only on the reduction of Xi which is the thing which will have a moduli interpretation, as I'll explain in a sec. Um, so, so some other power, ni prime. And then what you want to do is you want to take this ai and sort of lift it to uh, all of xi, not just its reduction. And so a standard argument is that you can basically raise this thing to a huge p power, and it will have a canonical lift. So, so um, to the k for k sufficiently large will lift canonically to xi, and the, the canonicity is important because we'll start with sort of this thing being Hecke stable, and then the canonicity of this lift will tell us that this sort of lift is Hecke stable. Okay, and sort of. The, the main thing to check, the, the one thing you, need, you really need to check here is that, in fact, this AI is really a non-zero divisor, so that this map is really injective. So, so that's exactly what you need for this to actually be a, be a, a resolution, and so, well, let me say something about that. Um, I mean, the point is that in the interior of your Shimura variety, um, so this, this sequence of subschemes are defined first by 
sort of p, and then by a0, and then by a1, and then by a2, and so on. So as long as each of these things are cutting the dimension down, and they are, in the interior of your Schmoor variety, this is a sort of regular sequence. And so these xi's are local complete intersections inside the minimal compact, well, the interior of the Schmoor variety. And so what that means is it's pretty easy to check in the interior that this guy is a non-zero divisor. You just have to check it cuts down the dimension again. But at the boundary, you sort of have to work harder. And, uh, OK, so, so the main interesting thing to explain at this point is where these AIs come from. So I'm going to sketch the construction. So, so the idea is that this, this filtration of the special fiber of Schmerber variety is going to have something to do with the ekadel ort stratification. So let me begin by explaining that. Oh, by the way, I should say one thing about this. So if you've seen me talk about this before, or if you've one of the unfortunate few who've looked at my thesis, um, this is not exactly how the argument has appeared. But essentially, so I, what I did before is I wrote down a, se a bunch of short exact sequences and sort of shifted the degree of cohomology by one. But I mean, this argument is really equivalent. You've just spliced all those uh, exact sequences together. And the sort of advantage of doing it this way is that it sort of shows that you really can construct Gower representations valued in derived Heck algebras, if that's a thing that you want to do. So that's why I sort of explain it this way now. OK, so I have 14 minutes for which probably sometimes the most important part. So, so I'm first going to introduce the Ekadel or its stratification. So the idea is that if you have a geometric point of the Shimura variety, so k is an algebraically closed field, the principally polarized abelian variety uh, in characteristic p, um, you can look at the p torsion over k as a finite group scheme. And sort of miracle is that, at least miracle you don't know about these sorts of things, is that there, there are exactly, well, the miracle is maybe that it's a finite number, not that it's 2 to the n. But there are 2 to the n possibilities for AP up to isomorphism. And so for example, when n is 2 and you look at p squared torsion rather than p torsion, there's a sort of entire moduli. So, um, but for the p torsion, there's al it's always sort of a discrete invariant. And so we can use this invariant to stratify our Schmur variety or its special fiber. So, uh, by the way, the rest of my talk is just about the interior. So then there's some whole other business of sort of extending it to the boundary, which is, is not for today. So, so the special fiber of your Schmur variety has a decomposition. Well, there's some indexing set, which I won't need even to make precise. Uh, and so these strata are reduced and locally closed and have the property that two geometric points land in the same one if and only if the p torsion of the corresponding abelian schemes are the same. So, so the idea is that um, you want to create something like the Haas invariant over um, each of these guys, one of which is the sort of ordinary locus where you have the usual Haas invariant. And so Ekadel and Ort sort of provided a way to get started, which is that you have the theory of the canonical filtration. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider the, so if I take the universal abelian scheme, and I take its p torsion, and I just restrict to uh, one of the strata, so I'm going to call this g, it's a finite flat group scheme, 
over xw. So you should think that g is some sort of isotrivial finite flat group scheme, although that doesn't really make sense because the automorphism group of these finite flat group schemes are sort of positive dimensional. But all the geometric fibers are sort of isomorphic. And so, uh, so what we have is the canonical filtration Um, which is a filtration uh, a filtration of G by finite flat subgroups and I guess I just want to say that it all, one term in the canonical filtration is always the um, sorry, is always the kernel of Frobenius on G so this is the filtration by finite flat group schemes and sorry it's a c so it's two c it turns out there's always a self dual filtration so i use an even number to in for the number of pieces, and then the middle piece is always the kernel of Frobenius. Nope. Okay, so so um, Eckert and Ort show that um, so so what what you basically want to do is so you you have this. Uh, filtration, and you want to look at sort of what Frobenius and Verschiebung do on the sort of associated gradients for this filtration. And so, uh, so Eckedel and Orit show that there's a permutation. Well, I'm just going to write some formulas on the board, uh, which may not, well, that's what happens. There's a permutation sigma such that. Um, when you look at Verschiebung from g sigma i mod g sigma i minus 1, oops, it's piece Frobenius twist. Uh, well, first of all, that there is such a map. It goes to g i mod g i minus 1, and this is an isomorphism uh, for i in the range 1 up to c. And for Banius, um, takes g i mod g i minus 1 to g sigma i mod g sigma i minus 1, for Banius twisted. And that's an isomorphism for i equals uh, c plus 1 up to 2c. And so what you see is that sort of as you go around the cycles of this permutation, either way you have a sort of map up to a Frobenius twist, an isomorphism between g i mod g i minus 1 and g sigma i mod g sigma i minus 1. And this provides some sort of uh, rigidity to this otherwise slightly floppy uh, finite group scheme. And so what are you going to do with it? Well, so just for notational purposes, if g is any group scheme, then I'll let omega g be um, the pullback along the identity section of the sheaf of relative differentials. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start on the sort of Cohley algebra of some g i mod g i minus 1. And it turns out that these are always, it's not hard to show that these are always 
uh, vector bundles, except in the case where, um, so I should say, I mean, this, this filtration sort of refines a sort of connected atoll uh, sequence, which exists along this strata because all of the fibers are isomorphic, and the sort of bit at the top might be atoll, in which case I don't want to consider its coleogebra because it'll just be trivial, but otherwise, these are non-trivial uh, vector bundles. And so what I can do is I can go from omega gi mod gi minus 1 via either uh, pullback along Verschiebung or the inverse of Frobenius to omega uh, g sigma i mod g sigma i minus 1, Frobenius twisted. And maybe if I let n be the order of sigma, then I can keep going, well, by taking Verschiebung or Frobenius inverse again, keep applying sigma to the index and getting a Frobenius twist, and then I'll wind up eventually, because this is a permutation, in g sigma to the n i mod g sigma to the n i minus 1 with a p to the n Frobenius twist. And of course, this is just the original thing with a big Frobenius twist. And what I'm going to then do, maybe I'll call um, this map sort of bi. Now, because, so the, the Cohley algebra of my universal abelian scheme is also the Cohley algebra of the kernel of Frobenius, which is this GC. And because of that, the Hodge bundle restricted to this uh, ekedal ort strata will factor as a tensor product so, sorry, the determinant of the Hodge bundle, will f there will be a filtration on the Hodge bundle which will uh, make the determinant be the tensor product from i equals 1 to c of the determinant of omega gi mod gi minus 1. And so the thing I'll consider is um, what I'll call aw, uh, which will be the product from i equals 1 to c of the determinant of bi. And so the determinant of bi, if you'd like, could be thought of as a section of the determinant of this guy to the p to the n minus first power. And when you multiply them all together, you get a section of uh, omega to the p to the n minus 1. And it's non-vanishing because all these maps are isomorphisms. OK, so I haven't actually done anything yet. I've just, well, produced a non-vanishing section. In fact, essentially this construction, or, or rather the, the proof that uh, omega is a torsion line bundle on this ekedal oort strata already appears in ekedal and oort. So the theorem, which I'll not say too much about the proof, is the following. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the one on G. So when I say this, I'm saying that, for example, Verschiebung maps G sigma I P into G I, G sigma I minus one P into G I minus one, and the induced map on the sub quotients is an isomorphism. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, otherwise there's no such map. Uh, oh, well. Okay. So let me just sort of state the theorem. Um, so theorem is that um, so for some integer k, which is sufficiently large, or any sufficiently large integer, um, this section, a w to the k, um, extends to a section of, well, uh, whatever it's supposed to be, so omega to 
um, the k times p to the n minus 1. Uh, now, not just on the open ekedel oort strata, but on its Zariski closure. And it vanishes precisely on the complement of the open strata. So it vanishes precisely on xw bar minus xw. And has some further properties. For example, it's sort of heck equivariant, prime to p heck equivariant, which is sort of basically obvious from the functoriality of Frobenius and Verschiebung. Um, it extends to the boundary, and I guess it's, oh, it's basically all one needs, I guess. So, anyways, so let me just say what the idea behind this proof is. I mean, it's, it's really just a sort of calculation in the deformation theory of abelian varieties. So, I mean, the idea is that, so suppose you had like a DVR where, and an abelian scheme over it, where the generic point lands in your Ekedel Oort strata, and the special point sort of lands in the boundary, or a lower, a smaller strata. So, you'll have this canonical filtration extending over this DVR by the value of criteria of properness. And on the other hand, that won't be the canonical filtration, or won't, won't really have anything to do with the canonical filtration of the special fiber. And in particular, these maps will sort of fail to be isomorphisms in the special fiber. And so, when you write this section down, sort of every time you apply Verschiebung, you'll get a zero, potentially. And every time you apply Frobenius inverse, you get a pull. And you just have to add them up and see that you get more zeros than pulls. So that's, that's somehow the idea. Okay, stop. So just to clarify, your, when you discuss the deduction of theorem A from theorem B, so you, you spoke about the cohomology of some simplicial complex, and in theorem A it's the cohomology of some, of some uh, symmetric space. So what, what is the relate? I didn't understand what was, what was intended to... So, I mean, the, the, the point is that... Um, so th I mean, again, this is this sort of miracle that I lear well, one learns, well, I learned from the work of Harris, Lamb, Taylor, and Thorne, and I guess was originally exploited in the work of Harris and Zucker, which is that um, when you look at um, the toroidal compactification of a Schmur variety, um, sort of a, a piece of this dual complex looks exactly, it, as a topological space, is exactly a union of arithmetic locally symmetric spaces attached to sort of the corresponding parabolic. Uh, well, I guess the linear part of uh, the levy of the corresponding parabolic. So, um, somehow it just falls out of the theory. I mean, it, and, but it's also kind of a miracle. I mean, maybe... Literally, it's a triangulation. The, the, the data that are used to construct the uh, toroidal compactification are involve a triangulation of the specific symmetric space. Or, or this So you're asking for which group so does this work? The first one where the Betty Commodity is talking about GLM A. Yes. So, so you claim that this space uh, somehow is related to topologically to the simplicial complex. Yes. And also the dimension of the cohomology that you want is different. You have 2n plus 1, GL2n plus 1 FP bar in one theorem, and G, GLN FP bar in another theorem. So. Yeah, so but. Uh, um, so if you think about, sorry, so you're asking about the degrees of the yeah. cohomology. So I can't remember, but I think the dimension of this symmetric space, I, uh, we could work this out in a second, something like one less than the dimension of the Shimura variety. And so there's sort of space for the cohomology of the symmetric space sort of in the range of degrees in which your Shimura variety has coherent cohomology. Is that? 
Uh, well, maybe I should. Ask yeah, we, we, we can talk. That maybe that's the yeah. One more question. Hi, Sarah. Thank you, speaker.